nice to present the work, word and phrase dictionaries generated with multiple translation pads. Please. Okay, thank you. I'm Christopher. I'm, I'm a uh, third year undergraduate student at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, for, for the past year, I've uh, worked at the National Defense University in Helsinki, Finland, and done research. Uh, this topic is on uh, machine translation. Uh, and it's all on a paper that I've written together with uh, Joko Vanka, Mitri Haraldsson, and Janne Siipola. Here's the outline of my talk. Uh, first, we'll introduce the background. Then we'll state our research questions, go through the theory and methods, and then uh, present the results and discuss them. So, uh, there are multiple different me methods to approach machine translation. Um, one of the uh, perhaps oldest ones is using parallel corpora, so basically the, the same data in uh, different languages. Uh, there, there you uh, basically map, map uh, the same words in different languages to each other statistically. Uh, the problem with this though is that it requires uh, large resources which uh, often aren't available for uh, rare language pairs. So the, there are alternatives to this too. Uh, there's monolingual corpora um, which uh, requires uh, only a small amount of uh, bilingual data. Um, and then another option is, is to uh, have uh, two parallel corpora, where, where uh, two pairs of uh, parallel corpora where, where you translate through an intermediate language, which is usually a, a lingua franca like English. So monolingual corpora are the, the method that we're using. Um, here uh, you create vector space models of uh, each uh, language uh, th th that you're using. You ma map each word uh, to a certain point in the space. Then um, once you've created the, those spaces, uh, you learn transformation matrices between those uh, language vector spaces. And uh, th there are many different methods in which you can do that. that. Uh, then when you want to translate between the languages, you take the source language, uh, um, the, the word in the source language, um, you uh, project its representation into the target uh, language space, and then uh, you use a scoring function uh, you know, uh, which is based on uh, proximity uh, in order to estimate the uh, most likely um, target language translations. And you can also use monolingual corpora for indirect translations. So, uh, what are the things we, uh, we wanted to find out? Uh, firstly, uh, we want to uh, find the optimal par parameters um, in matrix translation. So, uh, should one use uh, an orthogonal or an, uh, a non-orthogonal uh, matrix, and whether uh, uh, softmax or the inverted softmax uh, is prefer preferable uh, as an estimator of uh, probability. Then. Um, the mo most important novelty of our paper is um, multipath combinations where you combine information from different uh, translation paths. Uh, here we have four different methods uh, in which you, you can con conduct multipath translations and we're trying to find how they, they perform. Um, and, and finally, we're introducing a new um, method of fil filtering um, translations, um, a, a new metric to be uh, precise. And we're measuring it against uh, an existing metric. Uh, so for the translation matrix, um, we're using two different methods. Um, an orthogonal matrix, which 
for which we use um, least squares uh, training uh, objective. And uh, then the other method is an orthogonal uh, translation matrix, which preserves uh, the normalization of word vectors. And we use SVD for that. And here you can see um, the result of uh, an orthogonal tra uh, transformation, whereas if you use a non-orthogonal matrix here, you might get, get the result closer to this. So on, on to uh, multipath translation. So the idea here is that um, you can use uh, either, either direct translation or different forms of indirect translation. Uh, so, for, for example, if you want to translate from Russian to Finnish, or from Finnish to Russian, uh, you, you can either uh, translate directly between those vector spaces or go through uh, a bridge language, which in our case is uh, English or French. And then you combine the information from those paths in order to obtain as many accurate translations as possible. Uh, so the, the first method is summation, where um, you sum, just sum, sum the probabilities from different translation paths. Then you can also uh, multiply those uh, probabilities together. Um, the third method is combo max, where uh, for each uh, potential uh, target word, uh, ta target language translation, uh, you take its best probability among any, uh, any of the paths. And each of these um, gives new probabilities for um, uh, for translation candidates, uh, based on which you, you can order them uh, by pro probability, and that then you get uh, statistics on on um, how often the correct translation is uh, the first translation among the first five, and so on, which is known as P at one, P at five, and etc. Um, the fourth method is uh, the margin method, wh where uh, you multiply the pro probability of, of the first translation of each path by the margin between the, uh, for, uh, the probability of the uh, first and second translation. Then you get a, get a margin score. You compare the paths, to, uh, pick the, uh, the best path in terms of the score, and return the, the first translation of that. And here, realistically, you, you only get, a, uh, get one result. Then, um, in some cases, you, you want to be really sure that your translation is correct, uh, in which case you need to filter out uncertain translations and, for example, uh, throw it to a human tra translator. Uh, in these cases, you, you need to use a confidence score in which you uh, discard uh, uncertain translations. The traditional one is uh, to use broad probability, um, which w works uh, quite well. Uh, but, but we propose that uh, prob the probability margin should be used instead, where um, you take the difference between the, the probability of, of the most probable translation and the second most probable translation as um, that would be a more natural, or natural perhaps, uh, uh, measure of, of certainty in your translation. Uh, as Corpo, we used uh, SOMI24 for, for the Finnish corpus, um, Google News for, for, for the English one, Wikipedia for, for the rest, and uh, we formed uh, bilingual word pairs in order to train translation matrices um, mostly through mining them from a dictionary, uh, but we, we also used uh, Google Translate in a few cases. And here we use the first uh, 5,000 word pairs uh, in each um, word pair set uh, for training and uh, the next 1,000 for training. Um, as for as for the performance of these uh, parameters, uh, we found that uh, the inverted softmax, which uh, penalizes 
uh, so-called hubs, uh, target language words that uh, serve as um, common translations for uh, as as first uh, as the most probable translations for a large number of source language words, um, and thus the inverted softmax was found to be generally better than softmax. Among the uh, ma translation matrix types, um, no clear overall winner was found between the orthogonal and non-orthogonal matrix. The only thing that was clear was, was that the orthogonal matrix performed be better in uh, indirect translations, like uh, translation from Finnish to English to Russian, and the non-orthogonal uh, well, was better in uh, tra translating um, words directly from one space to another. Uh, but on closer examination, we chose the orthogonal matrix for uh, multipath tests. And as for the different multipath translation methods, we found that uh, most of them uh, did provide uh, some improvements uh, in the uh, PIAT1 metric, which, which means that um, they provided the correct translation uh, uh, more often as the first translation than, than uh, uh, direct translation uh, alone. And we also found that um, in noisy translations where we have uh, two indirect translation paths, uh, you, you had a, a quite, quite significant improvement. Um, in, in, in both uh, metrics, actually, which is significant uh, uh, because you, you might want to use indirect translation be between two uh, rare languages like, I don't know, say, Lithuanian and, and Maori. As for the co confidence measure, um, we found that the probability margin uh, provides um, Usually, be better um, better accuracy um, uh, at the, the, the at similar coverage levels than uh, the, the raw probability um, for uh, for the PET five metric. It's about the same for for both of those. Conclusions: um, the the orthogonal uh, translation matrix is best at indirect translation and non-orthogonal at uh, the d direct translation as, as previously mentioned. Uh, the inverted softmax is preferable to softmax. Uh, multipath translation do doesn't prove accuracy in uh, some cases, but, but in, in some cases it uh, obviously didn't. Um, the uh, probability margin uh, was found to be uh, uh, preferable solution to uh, to broad probability. So found this novelty to be successful. And um, for for future research, we suggest that um, multipath uh, translation should be tested uh, on paths uh, using mo more than one intermediate language. For example. I don't know, Lithuanian to French to English to Spanish. Um, the effect of language relatedness and it, it, etymological uh, statistics should also be considered. So thank you for, for your attention and I'd <laughs> welcome any questions. Any questions? Comments? Uh, do you can suggest some free services which use indirect translation? Maybe some services which are better than Google Translate, especially for let's say less popular languages, Lithuanian and so on. Well, I I'm not sure that uh, any services used. It, it's possible that uh, that they are used, but. Um, we didn't really consider any any uh, existing services. That this is more more of a 
novel suggestion. Of course, um, I suppose so multipath translation ha has been uh, tested to some extent before, but um, I'm not sure it's it's very widely used. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, please. Yes, the reason why we are not interested in this kind of online translations because our mission on different universities kind of different trust that way that when they're not Christ that there is a uh -huh. available group but that is why we should do our own translation systems and second is that way that if you are example in Afghanistan there is not possible to get any internet connection that you should uh -huh. do your own translation systems and and secondly it's a little bit different of course that if it's this intermediate uh, good example in France, uh, French languages and Russian languages mm -hmm. have a lot of common words. Mm -hmm. that if you find this kind of good intermediate languages, then you can get perhaps the good result. But I think this Google is mostly in the real languages, this kind of English or, or I don't know exactly what they are doing. But I would suppose that some cases they go to the, this kind of intermediate um, languages because we are using this kind of unsupervised learning there and Finnish and Lithuania there is not so big databases for that. Mm -hmm. that that is the reason why this kind of un unsupervised learning uses intermediate languages mm -hmm. okay. more questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you so as I understand, your method can be applied on any language pair. But how much does the accuracy depend on the language specifics and on the resources, on the amount of resources? Uh, well, it d depends quite, quite a lot. Uh, like uh, The amount of resources and, and the quality uh, especially will, would be uh, perhaps the, the most important fa factor. Um, of course, um, it's possible that uh, uh, the relatedness of, of the, the languages might, might um, affect uh, the quality of the translation as well, which is why I uh, suggested in, in uh, the future work section that that m m might be a, an issue worth investigating. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now it's my presentation. So, about the sentiment analysis and the deep learning methods. In the first presentation before, I mean, Rolf said that the, the deep learning methods are very important. I agree with him. They are applied right now in every, in every field, and including uh, natural language processing as well. So, uh, but right now about the specific topic, so sentiment analysis. This is the simple categorization process where you determine the writer's or author's attitude towards some topic, some uh, product event, and so on. And uh, usually, of course, the attitude can be expressed very differently. It can be written, in c it can be uh, categorized uh, like with the stars, five stars, ten stars, but usually in the majority of works the attitude is expressed as positive, negative, and neutral polarity. So we are using the same categorization in this, in this uh, research as well. Why the, this research is so important? Let's say companies want to get the feedback about product services. Sociologists react to public events, uh, 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 determines the reaction about the public events. Uh, psychologists analyze the general mind state of communities. Of course, there are other very specific tasks as 
early threat detection because from from the internet comments you can already predict that somebody wants to send out something offensive against somebody and so on so sentiment analysis is a very highly researched topic and you can find publications on many many languages of course uh, the majority of publications are in english and there are also very different methods applied for this topic um, the most archaic methods i even do not present them here they are rule based when linguists create rules to detect the sentiment in the text there are also dictionary based methods when again experts or uh, methods with the help of methods you just identify the sentiments of different words and then try to find those words in the text and determine the sentiment of the, of the whole text. And of course, machine learning methods. They can be supervised and unsupervised, which are not so accurate. So let's focus on the supervised methods. And there are different techniques. The most popular probably are SVM, uh, near, um, uh, nearest neighbor or naive bears and so on. But the recent approach, the, re the recent research went to the deep learning approaches. And you can also find that in Semival task, which is organized for many years, you can find that at, la at, la at last uh, deep learning methods outperform the other uh, traditional techniques, traditional machine learning methods. See, so uh, they are getting more and more accurate over the different tasks because you, you have more and more resources to work with, with it. Well, a sentiment analysis task was also solved for the Lithuanian language before by using dictionary-based methods and uh, machine learning approaches, but in particular traditional machine learning approaches. But deep learning methods have never been applied before, so this is the first time and we just wanted to know how far we can, ho we can go, how accurate are the deep learning methods on the Lithuanian data set. And this is, the Lithuanian data set is composed of non-normative text, in particular internet comments. And we solved the, 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 this problem with the deep, deep learning methods and we also compared the results with the previous results that were obtained on the traditional machine learning approaches. So, uh, traditional machine learning approaches, they usually use different types of representations as well, in particular discrete representations. And as far as you know, the most popular approach is like bag of words, different n-grams, character n-grams, and so on. Uh, but, uh, the vectors are usually very sparse and you usually, the size of the vector is, is very often is equal to the size of vocabulary, which is not very convenient for the morphologically rich languages as let's say Lithuanian. Um, so um, there is another solution. By the way, neural approaches is more, how to say, uh, should be, even accurate, sol more accurate solution because um, neural networks are usually deep neural networks are applied on the word embeddings, where and but they use absolutely different interpretation. So they use distributed representation of of words in the space. So word embeddings. Uh, and word embeddings also encode uh, the semantical meaning. Uh, considering the context about around each word. You know, this Lithuanian language is not English language. For the English language, they have uh, very nice word embeddings trained on 100 billion words. I'm talking right now about Google word embeddings. But Lithuanian language, we do not have such a huge resources. So we trained our word embeddings on only 200 34 millions of words at least, at least such size of corpora, but still. And uh, as you can see all the param parameters here, so it was 300 dimensions, uh, continuous bag of words and uh, word to vector model. And we also used the negative sampling for that. 
and as the result we got uh, 688,000 uh, word embeddings. This is the data set because embeddings is one thing, right? But we also need the data set to train our uh, model for this, uh, for this task. So the data set contained, as I already mentioned, the non-normative internet comments, and they were annotated by, 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 by two human experts. And here you can see the balanced data set. We have equal number of uh, comments uh, for positive, negative, neutral, and neutral labels. So in total, there is not very huge data set, but if any one of you have ever annotated internet comments, you know that it's quite huge for the humans to, do, to, to prepare it. So, um, we used such experimental conditions because, you know, we're dealing with the non-normative Lithuanian language, but word embeddings are trained on normative ling Lithuanian language. And also, non-normative language contains very specific symbols there, let's say, emoticons that also express a lot of sentiment, right? And uh, one more problem in Lithuanian language is diacritics, because in non-normative language we do not use diacritics at all. Well, sometimes we use, sometimes we don't, but you know, if you have texts like differ uh, written differently, and if you train your model, you, your model uh, is not so robust, because the vectors are very distributed. So, um, there are different uh, treatment of those diacritics. One way is just simply to eliminate all of them from all the text and to see what is going on, right? This is some kind of distortion of the data. But the, the, the interesting thing that it actually helps. So this is the reason why I'm presenting it here. But of course, if you eliminate the diacritics from the uh, training data sets, so you have to eliminate them from word embeddings as well. So you again have to distort the word embeddings by eliminating uh, ambiguous embeddings. And another way, it, which is more clever, is to restore diacritics. But again, you need a specific method uh, that could cope with it. And for this uh, purpose, we were using the language model-based approach, which more, was more accurate compared to the character-based approach. And uh, as for, for in our experiments, we used two types of word embeddings, recurrent neural network and conv convolutional neural network. Well, actually, it, it, should, should, it seems that recurrent neural network should not be the best uh, option here because it considers the previous time steps but convolutional neural network it can generalize and even can uh, intrinsically extract um, like engrams uh, from the text and since uh, the best results in the previous research with the traditional approaches was where uh, the best results were achieved with uh, token unigrams and token biograms, we thought that convolutional neural network could help in this case as well. And we are using word embeddings, not character embeddings, not anything else, but simply word embeddings. So it seems that it is close to that experiment we performed before. And uh, with the... Uh, with the traditional approaches, for the comparison reasons, we used uh, token unigrams, token unigrams and biograms. Well, as I said, we experimented with the different types, but the best uh, feature type was uh, token unigrams plus biograms. And with the recurrent neural network and convolutional neural network, we used word embeddings. So the other uh, experimental conditions, we had tenfold cross-validation, we evaluated accuracy and F-score, calculated random and majority baselines that are actually 0 0.33 because the data set was balanced. And we also performed McNamara tests to evaluate if the differences between the results are statistically significant. So there are the results. You can see that actually the best results were still achieved with the traditional approaches. 
uh, because uh, well usually the naive bias multinomial gives the best results and the uh, uh, recurrent neural network and convolutional neural network are the last in this in this ex in these experiments but still it was interesting uh, it was interesting to see how far we can go with what we already have and here you can see the, co the connecting lines. It means that these differences are not statistically significant. Here you can see, by the way, here you can see the results on the original data set, which was not uh, pre-processed. Well, we changed emoticons uh, uh, with the specific words. We eliminated stop words. But, but we had nothing to do with the diacritics here. And here you can see uh, the results on the data set with eliminated diacritics. And the interesting thing that actually the accuracy increases. And also the accuracy increases compared to, to the original data set if you restore diacritics. So uh, the conclusion would be that diacritics elimination res restoration positively impacts the accuracy. Well the other uh, preprocessing techniques, let's say stop word removal negatively and emoticons almost help, help nothing. And the best results with deep neural networks were achieved with recurrent neural network and it was a little bit more than 71%, which is not high at all. And the overall best results were achieved with the naive bias multinovial, which is uh, approximately 74%. And in the future work, we are thinking about the para parameter tuning. Because right now, we just simply uh, use the default parameters of deep learning for J software. And uh, we also thinking about incorporation of the different word embeddings, because currently we were using just uh, simply word embeddings, but we can also think about using character embeddings and other or maybe mixed type of embeddings. Of course, more data can give better results when we are talking about deep neural networks. So increase, to increase data set is crucial in this task. And we also need some clever solutions for the non-normative texts. Probably, well, one of the best solutions maybe could be that uh, we could train word embeddings on non-normative text, but the problem is that to find such a huge amounts of, of, of these texts, it's, it's very difficult, especially for the Lithuanian language, because then you have to crawl the comments, or even in blogs, people write in normative language. So this is very specific type of, of, uh, of uh, sources where you can find lo those non-normative texts. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs> then I have to go here. Questions? <laughs> Please. Yes, this where to where it takes all this context information. And actually the problem is that way that this kind of word like good or bad can be very near in the vector space. And if you want to do sentiment analysis, you should need some other kind of optimization that you get this good here and bad opposite way. And there's a couple of methods to do that way. You replace this word to cut way this kind of algorithm what's uh, optimized for this kind of, for the sentimental, what you say, but the problem is of course that it's difficult to find so much data. But of course you can do that way that you combine two kind of embeddings, where it, one is for the contents and one is for the sentimental, or use some post-processing for the embeddings that they transfer in this vector space that way, that this pattern would are in the opposite way. That I think this little bit problematic that used only this kind of context work because it gives a little bit bad results if you compare that if you have okay. a for sentiment. 
Thank you. By the way, it is not a problem to find negative data for the Lithuanian language because people like to write negative comments, but the problem is with the positive data. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it's in your countries, but at this least... Is the change the relativity. But then the data... Is about yeah. It's not literally negative, it's like positive. You know? <laughs> But then the data set would be very imbalanced, and uh, again, it's not very good. Please. You think about the positives that you do not have enough data for the positive, yes, to train what the positive uh, words. Uh, how about neutral? neutral? You have well, uh, the experts annotated the, a lot of texts, and they had to determine if they think that internet comment is positive, negative or neutral. So actually much more texts were annotated, but from these texts we selected 1,500 1, of each of them. So there were neutral comments as well. Uh, what do you think about training um, this model uh, from, for example, Wikipedia articles? Uh, I mean, <coughs> with high quality articles, they must be written uh, with neutral point of view. Maybe it will be useful. Well, maybe, but this is not normative Lithuanian language. The problem is that it, this is absolutely normative. Well, Wikipedia was used for training word embeddings. Mm -hmm. But the data set, well, I don't know, maybe, but again, we can eliminate, let's say, diacritics from these texts, but we will not, we, we cannot change the content in there because no, non normative Lithuanian language is not only about diacritics, it's also about very specific diminutive words, very ab about specific hypocoristic words, even the, f the, the order of the sentence, and so on. So, uh, this is very, very specific resource comments that we cannot replace it with Wikipedia, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, what do you think makes uh, multinomial uh, naive base perform better than the other classes? Because it is very simple, and I noticed that when you have very small data set, it usually works the best. So, please. You may know um, we are working with Pinceta CIT, this um, physician rating website, and you will find a lot of data on this platform reviews for physicians, which are already labeled because the user um, gives the sentiment, so it's positive or negative ones. Or maybe you could use uh, this data as well. And of course, I know it's domain specific. In, in which it's language do you have? It's Lithuanian. Lithuanian, yeah. really? Okay. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And there are a lot of comments, so, so 80,000 um, reviews, so and it's really a lot of bad language. And the, these are comments uh, about from the medical domain, right? Yeah. But they are usually written in normative language because uh, people, you know, say their opinion about doctors. Yeah. So they usually write, you know, in a bit different language than in... Uh, I mean, I don't know how much time do we have already, so maybe let's move to another presentation. And with the topic improvement of reverse the dictionary by choosing word vectors by category inference, please.
I'm Yuya Marinaga, a master course student at the University of Tokyo in Japan. I am very happy to be to able to talk to you. It's my first English and abroad presentation. I'm sorry, we cannot see your slides. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Today I'd like to talk about the improvement of reverse dictionary. I'd like to start by talking about body's reverse dictionary and showing its example. Reverse dictionary is a system that returns words based on definitions or descriptions. So using this, you can search a concept where its name does not come to mind or even if you don't know its name. There is a commercial reverse dictionary, well, look reverse dictionary. For example, you want to search a word coffee and input a query, a hot dog burn drink like. Then, uh, when look returns search result coffee, chocolate, and so on. And when look reverse dictionary works fine, but its implementation detail is unknown. There are some previous researches on reverse dictionary, but in this presentation, I will talk about Hill's one and others are explained in our paper. Here proposed a reverse dictionary based on word embeddings and neural networks. I will call this model RDWE. RDWE is constructed from dictionaries, uh, definition, and defined word pairs and word to vec word embeddings. Word to vec is explained briefly in next slide. From those data, uh, this model received ah sorry. From those data, this model learned conversion from word to vec embeddings of input definition to defined words embeddings. Conversion is or and then or power explained later. After learning completed, the system receives a new input and converts the embeddings list to a certain embedding. Then ranks words based on their embeddings cosine similarity to the embedding to the converted embedding. Next I'd like to talk about word to vec briefly. Word embeddings are the words expressed as numerical vectors and Word to vec is the way to learn meaning for word embeddings. Word to vec word embeddings have some great properties suited for reverse dictionary. Cosine similarity uh, represent meaning similarity. And meaning calculation can be done through calculation and embeddings. So even if we employ simple summation with removal of stoppers as a conversion function, uh, RDWE can work, and uh, with more smish, with more uh, complex conversion, RDWE works better. So next, I will explain those conversion function, or LN and Bo. Then R uh, R L N is required neural network. This model inputs word embeddings in a description one by one to calculate the next the next vector and output the final vector. Uh, I omit the detail. Bow is bag of words. This model inputs summation of word embeddings of uh, description. Outputs are linearly transformed embedding. W, B, and U are learned from dictionary and word embeddings. We trained those models, then reproduced the Hill's evaluation results using user descriptions. Evaluation measurement is accuracy at n, the rate at which the target word is in the top n words, and median of the target word rank. Median is lower is better. This table is the results from a first and second rows, and we can see that compared with uh, just summation. 
power and or and then can learn more efficient conversion. From the second and third rows, we can see that compared with when looking Hill's repo, Bow has similar or a bit lower score in some metrics. However, from C and uh, third and last rows, we can see that current run look has been improved and is far better than Bow or uh, or LM. So we try to create more accurate RDWE to catch up with one look. Then I'd like to give an overview of our proposed model. Our model is very simple. In this model, we are trying to improve RDWE through accuracy, combining category inference function and health model, and employing refined word to back embeddings. For example, when this model receives a description, a hot dog burn drink as an input, that category is inferred as noun food. And using Hills R and 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 bow or bow, this model searches in noun food words, then outputs coffee, chocolate, and so on. Here's our LN and Bow RDW architectures are already explained, so next I'd like to talk about refinement of word to vec word embeddings. RDWE is based on word to vec word embeddings, so its performance certainly depends on word to vec embeddings quality. Then it is a natural consequence to refine word to vec embeddings to improve RDWE performance. There are several ways to refine word to vec word embeddings. For example, modifying word to vec model or increasing training corpus and so on. We employ the most simplest way, removing noise from corpus. We regard the synthesis involving non ASCII characters as noise, then we trained word to vec embeddings. By this refinement, here's RDWE model score are improved significantly in medium, about a half medium. AUC is our new refined vector embeddings. Next, I'd like to talk about category inference function. I will explain what, why that is needed and what that is. The reason of category inference necessity is due to re relationships between word embeddings and word to vec embeddings, uh, word, word categories and word to vec embeddings. That is, intuitively similar words, for example, bed and asleep, and cat and meal, and so on have similar embeddings that belongs, belong different category. This kind of flexibility is one of the strong points of word to vec, but not suitable for reverse dictionary. Hence, however, if target words category can be inferred, early WE will have higher performance, so category inference is needed. Then, how do we infer target's category? There are several ways to infer category from a description. We chose a neural network for inference. Uh, okay. There are several ra uh, sorry. We employed Kim's convolutional neural network text classification as category inference neural network. I cited this figure from that paper. In this architecture, multiple filters extract feature candidates, feature candidates, and the next polling convert them to feature vector, feature vector. Then flea connected layer with softmax receives it and outputs prediction. The output is stochastic vector for each category. We train this CNN text classification model for reverse dictionary tasks. 
Training data is word embeddings and each concept category and that concept's definition words, definition pairs. Yeah, we used WordNet LexName as a category. Lex names are category names in WordNet. Uh, there are 45 Lex names consisting from noun animal, noun food, and verb emotion, and so on. We combined this module to order that the we. Yeah. I need to hurry up, so um, uh, yeah. in proposed model, multiple top categories are employed according to certain threshold. Now I've explained all modules of our model. So next, I'd like to talk about experiments of on um, proposed model, data and conditioning. Experiments are summarized in summarized here. Uh, for training, hills old or our refined word embeddings and word definition pairs and category definition pairs are used. For evaluation, two hundred of user descriptions are used. Ninety thousands of words composed experimented RDWE's search space. Evaluation results are revealed here. First row is reproduction results of Hill's model. Second row is CNN category inference combined with Hill's, no, Hill's model. By combining category inference, early W performance is slightly improved. And third row model is using refined embeddings in addition to combining two models then further improvement is accomplished. This improvement is statistic statistically significant, but still one look is better about all measurements in this table. Still, however, RDWE is superior to one look in accuracy at 1000. Accuracy at 1000 seems useless measurement at all, and actually useless for users, but thanks for that advantage, um, we can improve performance of the look reverse dictionary. RDWE has high accuracy at 1000 and not many common words with when looks top results. As a result, uh, if one looks searches only in top 1,000 words in words of RDWE, many noise words will be removed from top results. The results are shown here in this table. From this result table, we can see that when look reverse dictionary can be improved using RDWE as a search space filter. Median rank is about a half. That is a great improvement for the commercial reverse dictionary system. Conclusion. We improved reverse dictionary using word, word embeddings by refining its basis word to back word embeddings and employing category inference function to deal with certain property of word to back embeddings. And we improved run look reverse dictionary by employing RDWE as a search space filter, taking advantage of RDWE's high accuracy at 1000. Our future work is additional improvement of RDWE and catching up with run look reverse dictionary. There are some ways that may lead to improvement of RDWE. For example, employing multi-sense word embeddings also can deal with category problem and word ambiguity. Or expanding BOR and RLM architecture. Now we are engaged in second approach and writing next paper. 
Reverse dictionary takes tasks uh, similar to translation tasks. So we can use expressive neural translation models. We choose we tune neural translation model for reverse dictionary tasks and combine our another uh, regional module, then very similar performance to when look is obtained. Details will be revealed in our next paper. Thank you for your attention. Okay, then I will ask about the uh, training testing data sets. Yeah. Do they overlap? Ah, yes. Uh, how much do they overlap? I mean, how your method would behave if I would have absolutely different definition of the words that that method have never seen before. So can this method work only on the uh, words and description pairs that it seen before, or it can, or it can work on, on any, any other data. Um. Training data is uh, this dictionary data. And evaluation data is user data. So training and evaluation uh no overlap. Oh, no overlap. The, the training data and uh, where the definition pairs are uh, several dictionary data are used. Okay, but I see right this there. category definition pairs are uh, only word net data. Okay. The this but the method probably will not find the world the word that was not trained on yeah. okay so those 200 in the test set they should somehow overlap with the training data as well because if the word was not seen anywhere so it will, will not be defined okay do we have other questions if no, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we are going to the fourth presentation, determining quality of articles in Polish Wikipedia based on linguistic features. And the presenter is Vladimir Launas. Thank you. I will Copy first. of inputs and different yeah. to choose. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Laba Diana, uh, good afternoon. My name is Vladimir Slivanevsky, I'm from Poznan University of Economics and Business, and uh, this conference is a second presentation uh, connecting with quality of the um, uh, Wikipedia articles. In this presentation, uh, I will describe our research um, which are connecting with Polish Wikipedia and uh, how we use linguistic features to predict quality of these articles. Uh, this is short agenda. First of all, uh, 
short introduction, why Wikipedia, uh, some uh, information, general information, especially about Polish Wikipedia. Next, I will uh, shortly describe related works in this area. Uh, next, I will show what features we took into account and which data set we generate to uh, build models. And next step is building these models. Uh, in this step, I will also show you some information about importance of the features. And the uh, last thing that uh, I want to explain that what are conclusions and uh, what work we plan to do in future. So Wikipedia is the fifth most visited website in the internet. <coughs> it's a popular knowledge base. Uh, it has over 48 million articles and this article is written in over 300 language versions. It's free and everybody can edit, create articles in this encyclopedia. Even if you not log in, you can uh, anonymous edit this uh, content of this encyclopedia. Additionally, uh, this uh, encyclopedia is used for enriching other knowledge bases. For example, DBpedia, Wikidata, and other. If uh, we want to describe Polish Wikipedia is one of the most developed uh, language versions. Uh, it consists over one and three million articles. Uh, it has also five quality grades for assessing the quality of these articles. Uh, so we have featured, good, correct, start and stop articles. But over 99% of this every article in this language version uh, has no quality grade. So two questions, maybe two main questions of this research is if it's possible to assess these articles with no grade using linguistic features. And the next step, can we find which features are more important in this model. So, uh, of course, if we talk about quality of the Wikipedia, uh, is a wide topic in the scientific world, um, but most of them are focused on the most, um, uh, the biggest language version, which is English Wikipedia. So, for Polish, for example, uh, language, we do not find a lot of. Uh, papers. Um, so, based on these works, previous works, we can divide researches uh, which are measure quality of the article into two groups. First group assess the quality based on the content features. Mm, they can be such as tanks lengths, number of images, sections, references, and others. Uh, but there is another category of researches which are um, focused on the features related to editors. Uh, their behavior, maybe reputation, uh, they also um, analyze uh, uh, network of the users uh, and so on. Uh, sometimes uh, in these researches uh, authors used linguistic features, but these features is language um, dependent. So if I want to mm, assess uh, not English but other language version, I must choose to find specific vocabulary, vocabularies and tools. So what we do, we use some of these tools or vocabulary. In the Polish language, one of the popular is uh, polymorph, is a vocabulary, morphological vocabulary. Um, 
we used in our paper to describe these different features notation, which are um, used in morphosynthetic maker system in Polish Academy of Science. But we will also provide own notation for uh, some other features which we extract using own, uh, own parsers and some different sources. For example, uh, we, use, we use also words from frequency lists. You can see some of these um, lists. We also use Polish Wikipedia to assess which, are, uh, which words are often used in the text. Also, we use Wiki, Wikinary. It's some other pro project uh, than Wikipedia. Uh, but also, we can enrich uh, our group of the features with this source. A uh, number of unique words. Uh, it can be unique verbs, nouns, adjectives, also long words, and others. In our work, we have over 100 linguistic features. For Polish, for Polish language. Um, of course, length of the article can be different. And uh, previous work shows that if article uh, have long text, uh, it's a bigger possibility that this article have high quality. So, to create some more challenging task, maybe, we normalized every features. So, even if article has more verbs or nouns, it's not so easy to say that it is good when we normalize this parameter by word count. So, data set. As I said before, uh, English or uh, Polish Wikipedia has a lot of unassessed articles. And here, uh, in the Second row, you can see all of assessed articles, number of assessed articles. And we have about only 6,000 articles with quality grade. So we decide to use two, two data sets imbalanced when we choose all of uh, articles with quality grade. But we also choose from this set randomly um, certain number of the articles in each uh, category. Uh, we, uh, as you can see in the last column, we join, we group these articles to the two groups. It often, it's uh, often uh, this practice is often used in other works. So we have two groups, complete, uh, which has articles with the highest quality featured and good, and incomplete articles, which uh, can uh, have space to improve. Um, here you can see distribution of the sum mm, of these features. For example, nouns, verbs, adjectives, and uh, words from a frequency list. One of these lists of the frequent used verbs, uh, words. Uh, these clouds uh, shows distribution of the different um, features. For example, for noun, we can see that this red cloud uh, in this red cloud, each point is value of this parameter for each article. Uh, the same is for blue cloud. And you can see that these clouds are different, but we see some coverage. Here, we can see value from 0 to 1, because these features, values of these features, was normalized. So we see big overlap between these clouds. So additionally, it is a challenging task to divide these two groups, complete and incomplete articles. But machine learning can help us. Uh, 
and you uh, see uh, results of the building models uh, based on balanced data set and imbalanced data set. Uh, also, we decide to extract features from not only text of the article, but separately only from lead section of the article. It's the beginning uh, when you have some short information about some subject. But bigger precision we can have when we considered text, whole text of the article. Um, we use random forest algorithm, which we used also before for similar tasks, which show uh, quite big precision. This algorithm allows us to measure importance of the features. So these graphs on the right, of course, due to the limitation of the space, uh, it may be small, but this graph shows uh, differences between models and show which features are more important than these models. Uh, so if we take into the account data set with whole texts, uh, we can say that important features are impersonal verbs, third person verbs, unique nouns and un unique verbs. Additionally, using these models, we try to assess articles without grades. Uh, we choose half million randomly chosen articles from Polish Wikipedia, and uh, in this group, about four or five percent can be determined as complete, so with high quality. So what are conclusions of our research? First of all, linguistic features can help to assess quality of the articles in the Polish Wikipedia. Uh, next, it's better to consider the whole text of the articles to extract the features to build model. Uh, we uh, had over 93% of the precision in our model to divide two groups of article complete and incomplete. And about 4-5% of unassessed articles can be considered by the Wikipedia community as high quality articles. Um, of course, there is a lot of work in Wikipedia uh, connecting with quality and I present some of the direction which we plan to do. First of all, we want to expand number of features. Uh, our previous work uh, concerned not only these linguistic features, maybe some simple, complex. Um, we have now over 200 different features. Is, and this, these features are language independent. So if we add some linguistic, we can have more. Uh, we want to consider also other language versions, including Belarusian, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, and others. It's interesting to analyze uh, Wikipedia articles from neutral point of view. Maybe it also will be some case uh, which can help to improve quality of the articles. And um, interesting is using these linguistics features and techniques to extract the facts from the uh, articles uh, to enrich, for example, semantic databases as DBpedia Wikidata is. And uh, here you can see some projects which are connecting with uh, assessing quality of the Wikipedia and improving quality of the Wikipedia. Wikirank is uh, created for quality comparison of the articles in different languages. Infoboxes uh, concentrates on the specific part of the article and it assess quality of the infoboxes in different languages. And Wikibest is a game uh, for uh, 
quality assessment of the Wikipedia. So users can assess by own, uh, choose the best language version, and this data will be used in the future researches. Okay? Thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, are, are you aware of any bots that might use this kind of... Uh, of course. Data, yeah, ...to improve of in, in Polish Wikipedia as well? Uh, aware bots will, will be uh, do some bad things or good things? Uh, yeah, well, obviously, uh, bots that edit, edit Wikipedia in order to improve the quality. Ah, uh, you know, it depends on Wikipedia community in each language version, because in each language version, um, we can have a different grade system of the criteria of the assessment of the Wikipedia articles. So it depends on community. If they allow to do this, it's not a problem. For example, <laughs> there is Sibuano Wikipedia, which is the second most, the biggest uh, language edition, but who knows Sibuano? Yeah, it's, it's full of articles on French communes. Yes, but community of the Sibuana uh, Wikipedia allow bot to transfer information from other languages and they do not assess the quality, how this was translated. Uh, sometimes some community do not allow to automatic enrich articles uh, or the bots are limited in their, um, in their things because community want to do by hand. They maybe want to do it by, uh, maybe it will be m m better to do this with humans than robots. It depends. But of course we will propose our methods to each Wikipedia community to increase the quality. Okay, I have the question as well. I mean, Linguistic features, they are very important. I agree with that. But the content is the most important. Are there any uh, measures how to assess the content of the topic? Is it possible, I don't know, maybe to translate to another language, to the English, and to see if the okay. articles about the same thing? I okay. don't know what methods are used the, for that. There are some methods which, for example, compare of concepts in these articles. Okay. This is first, but one of the interesting things is fact extraction of the content because you can if you understand this uh, you cr can create from extract from this text triples subject predicate object or object predicate subject uh, you can relatively easier transfer it for different languages and compare if this fact is the same okay so this is the method that is used for content analysis uh, can be used because we do not enter enough to this field, but we plan. Okay. Maybe with your help, Lithuanian language will in increase quality of Lithuanian language. Okay, do we have? Um, I would like to ask you about the criteria that you rate the articles. You said that you grade. If I put the article, it is good for me, so it doesn't matter how you grade. Uh, and according to this criteria, you can say it is bad or it is good. Okay. Wikipedia, each uh, communities in each language version of Wikipedia uh, define criteria for uh, quality assessment of the articles. So one of the criteria, uh, one of the criteria uh, told that uh, article must have references. It must be written from neutral point of view. It uh, must have some images, uh, proper structure, style, and so on. So even if you write some article and for your opinion is good, some of the users which are not um, agree with you will correct this or erase this article, delete this article. So you must uh, firstly, read criteria. They are written in the page. You must, you can read this, and you must to um, um, read this article according to these rules. We uh, 
want to uh, create this process automatic and based on assessed articles with high quality we want to understand which features uh, shows that this article is high quality. I yes, I only assess the article. I will compare, for example, your article with some article with high quality, and if some features, important features, in your article are low, so my model will say your article is bad. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And welcome, Frederick Bonner. NLP in OTF computing, current approaches and open challenges. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Frederik Bäumer from the University of Paderborn in Germany. And today I want to talk about natural language processing and the use case of on-the-fly computing. I want to present current approaches and open challenges. So um, you could say it's kind of marketing or advertisement for our topic. And I'm happy to be here. So our use case is on-the-fly computing. That means that we have different software services which we try to combine to a single software service. Um, and we try to fulfill the user requirements with this single software service. So for example, the user could write, I want to convert my images from, from color to black and white and I want to send my images to my friends and we will look for the correct software services, combine them to a pipeline and will uh, provide it to the end users. But, if, um, but you know that um, natural language is um, full of defects, something like inaccuracy, incompleteness and so on. And we have to work with these inaccuracies. So we developed a requirement compensation system, which is called Cordula, which uses strategies and indicators to find these defects and to compensate them. For that, it was necessary to also develop procedures, resources, and interfaces. And um, today I want to show you what we did, but um, also want to show you the state of the art and the open questions. So let's start with the state of the art. There are already um, software packages, really good ones, which um, can, for example, detect different defects like incompleteness, wakeness, uh, syntactic ambiguity. Uh, a famous one is Quas. Quas is um, a really um, great software package which um, is able to detect a lot of defects, so all you can see here. But um, it's a single application without any interfaces, so you cannot um, implement it in your own software. Um, and it's had, it has a um, high level of interaction, so it's not really um, fit in our on-the-fly computing approach. Um, it looks like that. So you see it's a typical Windows application. It's not in service. We, we, there are no APIs. Um, it's great, but it just do, does not fit in our on-the-fly computing use case. We cannot uh, use it as a service. For that reason, we developed Cordula, which um, uses really great natural language processing tools like Decore from Stanford or Babelfy for um, lexical disambiguation. And we use these single services, combine it in one single tool, and are now able to um, f 
find and, and compensate defects in natural language requirements. Um, Cordula is a huge um, pipeline. It's um, uh, the entry users write their software requirements as an input. We do a lot of pre-processing. We do um, function extraction, so what is really wanted, uh, converting an image and sending an image, for example. We do the disambiguation. Uh, the compensation is info if information is missing. For example, if you only say, I want to convert an image but uh, and I want to send it, so the information is missing to whom, and we try to comp compensate it. And we have this structured output for the next level in the on, com uh, on the fly computing, the software composition. Strategies, composition strategies uh, looks, uh, look like this. So it's quite um, large. Um, for example, it's starting with information extraction here, then the lexical disambiguation is following. And there are um, there is an information flow between the single steps. So the information extraction can um, has access to the lexi lexical disambiguation, the incompleteness compensation has access to the information extraction, and so on. Because, remember, if, you, uh, if we compensate incompleteness, we are adding new information in the um, requirement, and we could uh, maybe introduce new lexical ambiguity. For that reason, we have to, um, we, we can't do it uh, like sequential, we have to do it more flexible. In order to figure out which strategy is needed for compensation, we use so-called indicators. Indicators um, can be just the number of senses for a word or a number of um, possible senses for syntactical um, ambiguities. And um, if, we, if we find the indicators in the text, we choose a fitting strategy and apply it to the text. And after um, the compensation step, we just um, provide all information we extracted from the natural language requirements to the next compensation step, uh, composition step. Um, it looks like that, so there is a classical um, graphical user interface. The users write their requirements uh, in this box and press analyze. And as a result, um, the user gets this structured view. So, um, you can see that even two long sentences, two complicated sentences will be splitted. There is a um, compensation if some information is missing, but uh, the information is somewhere in the text, but not, on, not in this specific requirement and so on. But, so that's, that is what we already have done. So it's, it's quite, quite good, it, it's working, and it's good enough to um, have a little prototype. But there are open challenges, and I, want, I really want to invite you to work on uh, these challenges as well, because it's, for example, a um, challenge for us to extract uh, the core functionalities in the right um, order. If you write something like, I want to send emails to my friends, first I need to write them, and then I want to attach my files. Um, currently, functions are extracted as they appear in the text. But maybe it's senseless, because um, users are not writing as they need the service. So, and we don't know anything about the semantic dependencies. Dependencies can be, be hidden in the text, or just um, not be there at all. At the moment, we use linguistic hints like first of all, afterwards, to order the requirements, but it's way um, uh, not uh, good enough and it's not working. It's even more difficult to find um, hierarchical, hier hierarchical dependencies. And because if you say I want to send emails, uh, I want to send emails, I want to write them and attach some pictures, um, there is um, no information about the um, requirement to choose the files. And the next step in on-the-fly computing needs this information to select the correct services. We currently have no resources um, which provide this knowledge, um, which is um, one of the main challenges of us. We, we need more resources, natural language resources, in the field of requirement um, engineering. Because we often um, challenge the situation that we need more information, uh, which only the, the user can provide, we developed Cordula um, in the second version, which is more um, interactive. It's uh, like a chatbot. The uh, user is um, communicating with Cordula as a chatbot, and Cordula is extracting the um, core functionalities and is um, presenting possible defects to the user and asking, could you please provide more information? But this is um, 
originally not the idea of on the fly computing because on the fly computing should be super fast and without any um, interaction. So there's originally no user in the loop. But now we use the chatbot to um, gain knowledge about um, the domain. So this is something like a compromise. As I said, um, we need more resources. At the moment, there's a lack of resources. We are developing, of course, resources like this one for the compensation of incompleteness. Um, we acquired, for example, download.com, uh, which is an um, awesome resource for software um, descriptions. But it's uh, still another domain um, because this is a user requirements and software descriptions are just a uh, different point of views. So the wording is different. Um, but it was a good start. And we use BubbleNet, for example. We enriched BubbleNet with this donor.com information to um, compensate incompleteness. But we still need examples and dialogues because the chatbot is not only um, presenting the uh, defects, um, it's also helping with um, hints and uh, examples how to do it better and, um, yeah, and so on. So we need more resources. Uh, we have a knowledge base, but it's quite small. So to conclude, um, at the moment we are able to detect and improve linguistic shortcomings, uh, shortcomings but we are not um, good enough. Uh, we can uh, treat ambiguity, incompleteness and wakeness, wakeness but it's still uh, a big challenge, especially wakeness because resources are missing. Um, our current approach is data-driven and demand-oriented, um, but there's still a lot, to do, a lot of work to do. We need better integration of users and we need better resources. And I want to invite you to work with us uh, on this topic. We are working on this topic now since uh, eight years. Uh, I'm involved uh, for four, uh, four years, and we hope that we will work on it for another four years and that our project will be um, accepted one more time. So thank you very much. I'm open for questions. We have the time for only one question, so please go to Okay, you said you you asked us to work together. But what language can we work on the Lithuanian language as well? Of course, yeah. But I so think the resource problem will be so even harder. So I, well, that's what I'm asking about. Okay, so what do we need to start, even to start working on mm -hmm. the Lithuanian language? Um, at the moment, we are supporting German and English, and we started with um, requirement descriptions in natural language. So really, um, if um, you or me would just writing what I expect from a software to do. This is the perfect starting point because you can uh, then extract all the core functionalities and so on from this text, identify the defects in this text and so on. Yeah. But this is also challenging because companies, for example, don't want to share their requirement um, requirements descriptions and it's a pity. It's yeah. Yeah. You're just stuck. I agree. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right now, I want to invite Chris Dafar Aminov with the presentation text augmentation techniques for document vector gener generation from Russian news articles. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, well, once again. Christopher Aminoff, uh, uh, I'm a student at the U University of Edinburgh uh, in, in Scotland, but, current, uh, but today I'm uh, representing um, the National Defence University in Helsinki, Finland, which I wor worked for uh, for the past year. And the topic of this talk is um, our, our uh, text augmentation techniques uh, that can, can be used to improve uh, document vectors that, that are then generated through uh, Corpora. And I've authored this article together with uh, Alexei Romanenko, uh, Onni Kosoma, and Jok Vanko. Here's the st structure of my talk. Um, first, we'll talk about the motivation and state the research question. Then we'll go through existing and, and the ones that we're introducing. Um, 
then uh, I'll present our methodology, uh, present the results, and then d discuss them. So why are, are, are we even doing this? Um, augmentation has been found to have a significant effect on uh, the presentation of uh, morphologically rich languages, uh, i.e. languages where, uh, where, where words can be extended with suffixes and prefixes and so on. Um, extensively, and examples of these are uh, Finnish, Russian, and, and Czech. And um, on, on different la languages, uh, different techniques have, have uh, yielded different results. Um, and uh, in the case of Russian, uh, no comprehensive studies uh, have been uh, conducted on, on this subject. So our research question goes as follows. We're trying to find a combination of text augmentation techniques, so we're, we're not looking at the techniques individually and that their effects individually. We're testing those techniques through um, the classification of uh, vector representations of uh, Russian news articles. So, uh, at the moment, uh, and prior to our research, um, that, that there have, have already been um, techniques. Um, the, the most um, commonly known, perhaps, would be uh, lemmatization, uh, in, in which uh, each word um, in the corpus or in the text um, uh, is, is uh, returned in, it, in its base form. Um, then there's a part of speech filtering where uh, you filter out words that um, belong to uh, parts of speech categories that uh, you may consider uh, semantic noise, essentially. And then, of course, you, you can uh, just delete stop, stop words, so have a list of words you, you don't, don't want, and then delete them. Um, Word, uh, word weighting is a, a popular approach in, in this area. Um, the mo most well-known of this is probably uh, inverse document frequency, uh, which penalizes uh, words that uh, appear in a large number of documents in, uh, in the corpus. Um, <coughs> then uh, another uh, word weighting technique is relevance frequency, where, where you divide uh, the corpus in uh, relevant and irrelevant articles and um, with words depending on, on their, um, their representation in, in these categories. Then uh, there's class frequency which can be combined with IDF where you uh, with words based on their prevalence in different classes. And in order to classify documents, obviously, you need to uh, represent them. Um, and th there are var various ways in which you can vectorize uh, text. Uh, bag of words like representations, um, TFIDF is perhaps the, the most well known. You have uh, one element per unique word, and you can apply various weights to it to yeah, each word depending on its uh, presence um, in each document. Then you have paragraph uh, vectors, which is a, a technique based on uh, neural networks. Uh, then uh, you can also um, use uh, word vectors and, and combine those to form uh, document vectors in which case you get uh, weighted document vectors, uh, of which that, that, that there are various types. You can just average the words I in a document, in which case you get uh, mean document vectors. Uh, you can TF-IDF weight, weight them, and be, be use all, all kinds of weight, weightings. Um, there are various ways to uh, form word embeddings. 
uh, words to vacuum fast text are uh, one example that they're based on neural networks. Uh, Globy and Swivel are uh, uh, they learn through uh, co-occurrence matrices that, that they're learned through them. And on to the knowledges we're introducing. The first one is uh, a parallel IDFCF, which is um, a novel classification structure. Uh, it's, it's based on um, IDFCF uh, weightings, um, which, due to, to their nature, require that their own uh, form of classification. So here, for, for each document, um, the, in the test set, uh, you act as follows. You assume that, that that document belongs to class C, you, uh, and you compute uh, uh, weighted do document vectors as assuming that w uh, the words in there uh, have uh, weights uh, corresponding to class C. And then ba based on that weighted document vector, you um, use your, your class for to predict the probability that uh, document D, as represented by, by the WDV, belongs to class C. Then you uh, repeat the, the, uh, the first three steps uh, with each class. You take the, the most probable class and you uh, input it uh, in, into the classifier once again, and then, then you then um, you predict the, the final class and also w whether the, the representation is accurate or not. The second novelty is subject-object tagging, uh, in which you essentially extend the, uh, the corpus. Um, you anal analyze each sentence um, and determine uh, potential grammatical cases uh, for each, each word in the sentence, um, or at least those words that have cases. Um, then you tag all, all applicable uh, words as uh, potential subjects if uh, nominative is a potential case, and on the other hand, as potential objects if any other case is possible. Here's an, an example uh, where the cases are uh, definitely clear. Koshka uh, Mushku, a cat, it's, it's a mouse. Um, where we know that uh, Koshka is nominative, therefore we tag it as, as a subject. Uh, and Mushka is definitely uh, in the accusative, uh, therefore we, we tag it uh, as an object. And so, uh, as a consequence, we get a representation like this. Here you can see an overview of, um, of how each uh, combination of augmentation techniques was tested. Um, so uh, first we have the corpus, we, we apply the augmentation techniques, then uh, we get uh, a vector representation uh, for the, the document. Um, and then, then we, we input the, that, that document to the classifier uh, in order to uh, classify it and, and then uh, to assess the accuracy of um, the augment uh, accuracy of the classification mm -hmm. when the augmentation technique is, is applied. Uh, as our data, uh, we use the open corpora corpus which is openly available on, on the internet. Um, it uh, includes a mixture of te texts. It's mostly news articles, but uh, there are uh, blog posts, Wikipedia articles, uh, judicial texts, and, and so on uh, there as well. Then uh, of these, uh, we have a subset of um, documents that, that we use for classification te uh, tests. Um, specifically, that's Chesnik uh, Correspondent news articles that belong to one of these 
five groups. Then we evaluated each, uh, we conducted our, our, our study as a whole as follows. First, uh, we found uh, optimal SVM classifiers for each model that uh, we uh, plan to use um, and uh, for the classifiers we found the best parameters. Um, then we ran initial 1000 run classification test, tests uh, for, for each, each model where we used uh, five-fold validation in each run. Um, and th then we got initial results. Based on those, we um, took the, the four best performing models and th then you used those in subsequent tests. Then we tested all possible te uh, techniques, all possible combination as combinations of uh, augmentation techniques um, with uh, 100 run tests. Um, Use, using the, the models that, that we chose, and then um, based on average per performance uh, of, of um, each technique, we uh, chose one com combination and then uh, conducted a final 1000 run test on those. So uh, in the initial tests, we chose the, uh, these models uh, for uh, further experimentation um, with the first two swivel and Wurzweck since uh, they use uh, um, since they, they use combinations of word embeddings uh, we use them to determine the, the best uh, word weighting method and out, out of the four that we tested we found that uh, IDF weighting um, was the best. As for uh, the choice of uh, part of speech filter and um, whether or not we should use our, our novel technique, subject object tagging, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a clear, clear winner. Uh, therefore, we had to use a special loss function based on uh, the performance of uh, a specific augmentation technique uh, relative to the maximum performance of each model. And as a result, we found that uh, we got the smallest loss um, with an else plus adjectives filter. And we found that uh, using subject object tagging uh, did, on average, Im improve results. And um, here's the, the, the result of the combination that we arrived at. On average, we had a 4.1 percentage point improvement. However, if, if, you, uh, if we also factored in uh, the uh, document vector model, um, then we actually got the highest accuracy uh, with this combination here. So you using RF, uh, word weights, uh, nouns plus adjective filter, uh, but then we, uh, we wouldn't have tagging there. And this result was chip uh, with a swivel model. So to conclude, we found that uh, part of speech filtering does improve classification accuracy for Russian te text, at least in the, the case of our articles. Subject-object tagging is generally useful, uh, but, but we found that um, there was slight reductions in uh, performance of Swivel and TF-IDF, which were incidentally uh, the best performing models overall. But it's uh, still useful in general because it uh, we recorded significant increases in the performances of Doktivec and Wurtivec. Um, and IDF performed best overall out of 
for weighting methods. Uh, I would like to note that our uh, British research does have the limitation that uh, all document vectors were, were trained on, on the uh, same corpus, so, so any uh, test set um, documents um, had um, vector representations that were, were somewhat influenced by, by uh, the training set as well. Uh, however, th this shouldn't be a big problem uh, uh, since uh, most um, document ve vector models can be uh, trained further on new data. In the future, I'd suggest that uh, these techniques should be uh, tested on other tasks. We, we only uh, tested uh, text classification on other domains. We only uh, tested our techniques on, on news articles as well as other languages. In particular, um, other Slavic languages could be an interesting focus uh, with the, uh, regard to these techniques as uh, when we examined results on uh, um, uh, on Czech language corpuses, uh, we found uh, some similarities uh, between the uh, results in, in those experiments and, and ours. So, uh, thank you for your, your attention. And I would like to welcome any questions. You presented the example cat is a mouse. Uh, yes. Uh, and you said it's uh, obvious for us. What does it mean? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean it's o obvious for Russian, spe Russian speakers. But it does not because it, uh, for me, it could be that a cat, uh, a cat is mouse. That is a toy lying on the floor. My cat is. It could be a cake in form of. A mouse, he is uh, this one. So actually, how it uh, every sentence belongs to some context. So how you do in this semantics? Because it is not obvious from this. Uh, well, well, not know the the specific sentence. Koshka yes, myshku. I mean, koshka can only uh, be in in, in the nominative because. Uh, I don't know if if it was uh, genitive, uh, the form would be koshki, uh, no, no, and so on. No, no, it's subject, and of it's course it is object. Yes. But the meaning of the sentence. The the meaning of of, of the sentence. Uh, because of it's course. the semantics is the most important for the sentence. Uh, no, yeah. It, yes, uh, but but um, in in this case, well, we only use the the case for. Uh, for tagging it it's, uh, as a su subject, so um, it's it's not 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 the only thing that contributes to the semantics. And we we, we use word spec and other methods uh, to me include the context into the word uh, representation of the word. Yes, that was the answer. That, but using that kind of idea that in this neural network that the words around the, the, the context. When you teach about this neural network, you get the words what are around the cat. Yes, so yes, the context. Yes. You do analysis of the context. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So we have to continue today, uh, to finish today, and let's continue the next year, OK? Let's meet again, once again. And let's discuss. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to our session chair. Thank you very much.